Okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the final Center for Robotics and Biosystems seminar of the 2022-2023 school year. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kevin Lynch. There's some people joining us online. And it's my real pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Shiran Song. She's coming to visit us from Columbia, where she is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and director of the Columbia Artificial Intelligence and Robotics Lab. Before that, she received her PhD in computer science at Princeton University and her Bachelor of Engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Her research interests lie at the intersection of computer vision and robotics. Uh, Shiran's research has been recognized through several awards, the most significant of which, of course, was the Transactions on Robotics Best Paper Award <laughs> two years ago. Uh, but there's also several others, like Best Paper Award at Robotics Science and Systems last year, Best Systems Paper at the Conference on Robot Learning, also at uh, RSS, and finalists at RSS, ICRA, CBPR, and RLS, or IROS, IROS, sorry. <laughs> Many other conferences at the point. The point is she's got a lot of awards in a very early career, very young stage of her career at Columbia, doing really fascinating work, which is why we have her here today. And which many of you know also was why she joined us on our inaugural webinar on the topic of dexterity that we held back in January. So really fascinating discussion on robot learning and how it relates to robot manipulation. So that was back in January, kicked this off. We had four more after that, a really, really fun series. Um, she's a recipient of the NSF Career Award, the Sloan Foundation Fellowship, as well as research awards from Microsoft, Toyota Research, Google, Amazon, and JP Morgan. So with all of that as introduction, please join me in welcoming Shira. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, so I'm Shira, and today I'm going to talk about robot learning, but with in the physical world, right? So here in my title, I use the word gravity just as a very simple example of like uh, all the real world dynamics that a robot needs to kind of experience and deal with when they are deployed in the physical world. And as you will see in this talk, uh, this kind of dynamics can either be your friend or enemy, uh, depends on how you, how you treat it. Um, so I will start uh, with one of my earlier projects that really got me into the field of robotics. Uh, so it was year 2017, and we are working with a Burgess group from MIT to build this robot picking uh, system for the Amazon Robotics Challenge. So in this video, you can see that this robot is actually able to handle a pretty large variety of objects, right? Eventually, we are able to pick up all the objects in the bin uh, and uh, eventually with a uh, challenge. But one thing that might bother you a little bit uh, is how slow this robot moves, right? So I didn't really speed up this video just so that you can feel the slowness in real time. But on the other hand, um, if you ever get a chance to visit the real warehouse and see how this task is getting done today with the human workers, you will see that human just on a whole another level. Right? So for example, this worker is able to like, snatch the packages, toss them around, and sort them into the right location. And everything is highly dynamic and chaotic, but fast and efficient. So what is the difference? Right, so I think uh, formally we can kind of categorize this two type of manipulation strategy as quasi-static or dynamic manipulation. So for the audience here today, probably a lot of you are already like very clear about the difference, but it's still good to go over that. Right, so in the quasi-static manipulation uh, uh, scenario, we kind of make this assumption that the world stops or the object stops as soon as the robot stops. Um, and this kind of assumption is actually very convenient uh, in simplifying our whole planning problem. Uh, because under this assumption, we only need to worry about the object's geometry and, their, and the robot's kinematics, and we can kind of ignore other physical properties about the object. But on the other hand, dynamic manipulation, like the talking uh, action, is very different. So instead of trying to avoid dynamics, it will try to actively leverage the dynamics to help the manipulation process. Right? So for example, you, uh, by using the acceleration in the force in order to uh, um, more effectively manipulate the object. So as a result, when it works, uh, dynamic, manipul uh, dynamic manipulation oftentimes uh, can achieve much faster and efficient uh, system. So the question uh, is how we can make a robot from, go from like, this kind of quite static regime to this dynamic regime. And then before I start to talk about how we can do that, maybe I will first talk about some good news. So I think uh, really 
uh, we have like decades of research in mechanics and control and robot control. Really, today we have a lot of uh, good robots or good hardware that's able to like move really fast and very precise. And we can easily call up a demo like this, like this robot tossing this very tiny pen precisely in this little cup, right? and it can do it again and again. But the catch here is that this robot can only toss this one pen or this one object for this one target location. And in fact, we don't. The whole system actually does not even re really require perception or planning algorithms. So the trick is, if you, you just let the robot toss its pen and see where it lands and put a cup there, and it will work, right? And it will work again and again. Um, so what this example really, oops, oh, really showed us is that today we're actually really good, or like kind of pretty good on modeling the robot's internal dynamics and make it move very fast and precise and repeatable. But the remaining challenge is really about how to model this unstructured external world with all these diverse objects, which um, this diversity and complexity is significantly higher than the robot itself. So that is our uh, research, what we are focusing on. So how to model the external world? And so if we look at the literature, we can see that we actually made a, quite a lot of progress on like derive, uh, try to derive different analytic models for different dynamical systems. Right? So here I just kind of copied a lot of work from Kevin's <laughs> website. Right? So for example, uh, this is a model that you can use to describe the, like, the, the process of throwing a cloud, and you have different models that can describe different dynamical process. But one thing that's kind of missing from a lot of the studies is actually perception, right? which is actually oftentimes just simply considered as out of the scope, or uh, more than um, often that we kind of just assume that the perception is just a near a perfect state estimator for those analytical models. But what is the state of all these uh, systems or environments? Right? So oftentimes in, uh, in most of the works, we kind of use the object pose to represent the, the state of the object. Uh, or like if you're able to describe the pose of all the objects, you can describe the state of the environment. But that kind of definition will only work or make sense when you're dealing with rigid objects with no geometry. But oftentimes in our, in our actual environment, we often can need to deal with a lot of objects uh, whose uh, it's either unknown or like their pose or states is ill-defined or impossible to measure. Right? So for example, uh, how we can like, precisely define the state or the pose for a crumpled class or a pair of random leaps. And then how about their physical properties, like friction, mass, or like stiffness, which is even harder to measure. But if we take a step back and then think about how we as humans are able to kind of interact with all these unstructured environments and objects, it is not like that we are trying to spend all our brain power try to estimate the state or the pose of every single leaf in that pile. Right? So instead, what we are really rely on Maybe it's a sense of just an intuition, like where years of our experience kind of interacting and observing uh, all these objects uh, give us, let us learn a mental model of dynamics. So although this dynamics model may not be very accurate or precise, oftentimes it's sufficient to guide our interactions with all these objects. So the goal for our research is really try to impart our robots with a similar physical intuition that allows them to kind of directly learn from their physical experience leveraging close to the feedback all from raw sensory data. And in most of the cases, we are talking about uh, visual data, like images or videos. And here is actually an example of such system called tossing box, that basically this robot is able to learn how to precisely toss arbitrary objects into different target locations. Uh, so here, by using this kind of dynamic tossing action, the system is not only more efficient or faster than your typical pick and play system, it can also kind of extend its effective workspace or reach range by putting objects into faraway boxes that is further away than its maximum reach range. So that is also the two key advantage for using dynamic manipulation. And uh, in our lab, we actually studied uh, many different ways that a robot can leverage dynamics in uh, the process of manipulation. And in the whole process, we're really trying to, what we are really going for or looking, um, looking for is this general recipe for learning that robot intuition uh, so that we can enable more uh, uh, capabilities for robots. And today, I'm going to just use some of those projects as an example to help us re-examine the relations between 
perception modeling and action, and then think about how tools like machine learning can really help us to simplify some of those challenging problems. And what are some unique challenges and opportunities when we consider using machine learning method for those uh, tasks? Okay, so the first project that I'm going to talk about is uh, what's called Flingbot. So, uh, so in this project, we're going to try to make our robot to directly learn those dynamic actions from pixels without using explicit dynamics model. Right, so in this example, we'll see and I think it's a good example to kind of look at what are the some things that are possible with this kind of direct end-to-end um, -end formulation, and also, more importantly, what will be some limitations for this kind of formulation. So in this project, uh, the task that we try to do is uh, class unfolding that basically try to, uh, given any class, we try to increase the overall coverage of this class. Right? So you may not feel it immediately, but this task um, it's actually quite challenging for robots to kind of unfolding any class under any configurations for a few reasons. Right, so first uh, is that when you're dealing with cloths or garments or fabrics, they oftentimes have uh, very complex dynamics due to their extremely high degree of freedoms. Right, so oftentimes people even say that uh, for those fabrics you have near infinite degree of freedoms because you have near infinite ways to fold it or whatever. And then what makes things even worse is that among all these degree of freedoms, there's actually only a very small amount of them can be directly controlled by the robot through contact. Right? So for example, uh, in the case that the robot is kind of holding, holding up a piece of cloth, all it can control is actually a very small region around the gripper, like directly control, like small region around the gripper, and then the rest of the cloth kind of just hanging there, and the robot actually does not have direct control over all, all those kind of regions. So in another word, uh, a system with cloth is highly underactuated. Right, so those are the challenges when we're dealing with deformable objects like cloth. And then because of those uh, challenges, a lot of actions or like um, action primitives that were typically designed for uh, handling or manipulating rigid objects is oftentimes uh, very inefficient when dealing with deformable objects. Right, so for example, this kind of pick and place action, each of the actions can only affect a very small region on the cloth. And if the class is ever larger than the robot's kinematic reach range, then you're never able to fully unfold it unless your robot can climb over its workspace. So as a result, I think um, because of this uh, limitation, I think this quasi-static uh, action uh, assumption really become this kind of common bottleneck for a lot of prior works in class manipulation. And as a result, I think Despite there's a lot of developments and advancements on like modeling or perception on class uh, um, dynamics, the resulting system oftentimes is highly inefficient, and it, it, oftentimes it can take uh, about like hundreds of steps just to unfold a very small piece of class. Right. So in this example, actually this robot takes in total of 300 steps just to unfold this very small piece of class. So sure, just mm -hmm. a quick clarification. So mm -hmm. you say that. Each action can only affect a small region, but I think you can affect everywhere by pulling quasi statically, right? So I'm just, but the but the expressiveness or the types of things you can do is vastly limited compared to dynamics. Yes, that's true. If you consider the the, the environment as part of a manipulator, then you can actually using dragging to uh -huh. kind of have some kind of influence on other parts as well. Okay. Yeah, but it's limited, right? And also, that's not how we actually do the task as humans. Right, so typically, like, I think we are more likely to do something like this. Uh, given a compound class, we're going to use two of our hands, grasp it, and unfold it with a single fling action. Right, so what we just did here is basically you, by leveraging the accelerations in your action, in order to control those out of contact surfaces that are labeled uh, in, in green, uh, so that we can achieve this kind of unfolding task in just single steps. So with this kind of observation, um, the idea, the key idea for fling bar is actually very simple. Let's just use this kind of high velocity two-arm fling action for class unfolding. So here is actually the fling bar system in action, and also in comparison with a system that's only used uh, the quasi-side pick and place action. And you can see that, uh, uh, oh, and here we plot out the class coverage with respect to the interaction steps. You can see that fling bar is able to quickly unfold this class within two steps, well, the pick and play system will take uh, a long time to make smaller progress. So, how to make us? Okay, is that a question? Oh, maybe you're going to answer it. But I was just curious, like, how do you teach the robot to fling like that? Like, yeah, do you provide demonstrations or do you learn the problem? Yeah, we we will probably talk about this. Oh, 
in, in, in the following part, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to uh, enable the system. Uh, but if there are still questions at the end, we can, I, can, I can open it again. Okay, so how to make the system work, right? So here, I think instead of just talking about Flimba, I do want to use this as an opportunity or, or chance, kind of just uh, talk about some, uh, some high-level principles about how we can enable the robot learning system to work in the physical world. Right, so we know that uh, for if we want to apply machine learning algorithm, uh, all the ML algorithms need data, and oftentimes the more data, the better. But uh, getting data for robots is actually really hard. Like it's quite expensive, not only because um, it involves physical hardware, but also because labeling those data with the proper or correct robot action is actually a non-trivial task for most of the humans. Right. So we cannot really apply the similar uh, strategy like computer vision with label images and let them to learn. So that is a challenge for getting data. So to address this kind of data uh, uh, problem, our maths are oftentimes trying to bridge this data gap from both ends. Right? So from the one end, we always try to kind of scale up this uh, or like um, automate this data collection process by using self-supervised learning. Right? So in particular for a robot system, they oftentimes has ability, they, they kind of naturally have this ability to interact with the environment and then observe uh, their uh, future state or the result of the, their action, and then use those observations of the future state as a supervision for the current action. And so that can kind of provide us like this kind of self-supervised uh, self signal to train a lot of different tasks. And so for example, in the context of Flingbot, we can use a top-down camera that's looking at this workspace and then compute, automatically compute the delta cost coverage after every fling action and use that as a reward uh, signal for every, uh, each of the fling action. And then similarly for this uh, tossing ball example that we see earlier, we can also use a top-down camera to track where the object lands and then use the landing location to supervise each of the uh, tossing action. So even in the earlier stage, maybe the tossing, uh, the landing location is not correct, but that can be the correct landing location with respect to the action for um, for those uh, failure cases. It can, although it's a failure for maybe the, your target location, but it can be a positive example for this landing location. Right. So that's how we can collect, uh, like automatically label the training data. And then we'll combine it with some kind of automatic reset mechanism. The robot now has ability to kind of continuously collect the training uh, data 24 seven with very minimal human intervention. Right. So here it's actually, uh, I don't know whether you see how the tossing model resets. Right, so that's how it resets its training so it can actually collect data overnight. And we don't really need to uh, intervene in the process. And uh, that's how we can scale up the data collection. Uh, on the other end, we can also try to um, leverage some kind of the task structure or the inductive bias in, in the physical world in order to drive down the need of data. Right? So in another way, we try to develop more simple, efficient learning algorithms by incorporating the structure of the problem. And the common structure that kind of appeared in many of the robot manipulation tasks uh, is what we call spatial equivariance. Um, so that's actually, uh, so the spatial equivariance basically means that if you apply a spatial transformation on the input image, uh, like your observation, it sh should result in the same transform spatial transformation in the output action. And so here the F is corresponding to the robot policy that we want them to learn. So for example, in the context of Flingbot, what that means is that if you translate the input image, uh, the input observation by a certain amount, the output graphing uh, location should also be translated by the same amount. Right? And similarly for rotation and scale. So actually with the right action parameterization or formulation, you can actually observe this kind of spatial uh, equivariance in many different robot, uh, robot applications. Right? So for example, pushing, grasping, placing, or even navigation. And uh, this is actually such a common structure that appeared in many robotics tasks. But you'll be surprised that many of the today's learning-based robot policy cannot perform this very simple generalization without a large amount of training data. So to leverage this kind of spatial equivariance uh, structure, we uh, oftentimes use this uh, method called spatial action map, where the algorithm will, instead of trying to uh, predict directly the action parameter from the input image or regress the action vector from the input image, will instead try to predict or output a dense value map for all the possible actions for all the pixels, right? So here, each of the uh, pixels is corresponding to a single graph location uh, centered around that pixel. And then the uh, uh, orange, and then 
by using this uh, kind of uh, a fully convolutional neural network, we can uh, automatically get the trans uh, translation of equivariance. And then to get the rotation and scale equivariance, we can actually explicitly transform the input image and then predict the corresponding value uh, uh, value mass for each of the transformed inputs. And so that we can get the rotational and scale equivalence as well. So I think uh, what that all, all this means is that in the end of the day, uh, this value network, which is the, 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 the uh, value function that we're trying to train, only need to learn the value function for a fixed action parameter. Let's say that scratching this class uh, in, uh, in the center pixel uh, with the fixed width and uh, horizontally. And then this function will automatically immediately generalize to other action parameters by applying the same learned function in under transformed input. Uh, so this kind of generalization capability really can help us to drastically reduce the data needed for learning this function. And then once this, uh, so what I'm talking about here is all about that determining where to grasp the cost. And then the fling action is a, a primitive that we defined uh, that is prime basically by the grasping location. So the action of fling is uh, pre-programmed. Uh, so hopefully that makes answer the question. So uh, and I, I actually, if you're interested in like uh, sample efficient learning, I think spatial equivalence is something that you really want to uh, maybe want to look into. I think it's actually a very powerful tool. And there's actually a lot of work recently uh, studying how we can directly incorporate uh, uh, the, this kind of spatial equivalence structure into the neural network. So you don't need to do this kind of data augmentation in order to get this good properties. So I guess how big is your parameter space that you're learning over? Like what's the size of the parameter space that defines the action that you're actually tuning? Yeah, so the, the action space is uh, 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 the, the, the grasping location we parameterize with the center point, the rotation angle, the width. So three parameters. Yes, and also the fling speed. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, so here, uh, if I, in the end uh, of the training, uh, the whole system is able to achieve over 80% of coverage. Uh, typically, we use three interaction steps for unfolding uh, different garments and class. Uh, and it's also able to unfold class that's larger than the robust maximum rich range, which is just something that uh, pick and place cannot do. And it's also, we see that it's able to generalize to unseen shapes like uh, t-shirts or garments, uh, where it's only trained on rectangular class. We only train with rec uh, rectangular class. Uh, but it has a certain limitations. If you assume it's a pen, it will probably have a uh, struggle to generalize to that. So and, 80% mm -hmm. means that 80% of its maximum size? Yes, yeah, size. yeah. Um, and you can see more results on the website. It's actually pretty interesting or satisfying to look at those results. And here is just a little bit of a uh, quantitative uh, comparisons. And uh, one particular experiment I want to point out is uh, this baseline of uh, training fling bar, or all the uh, trying to directly regress those fling parameters, that five parameters that we uh, talked about, without using the formulation of spatial action maps. And you can see that there's actually a pretty large uh, performance gap. And I think that just highlights the importance of leveraging spatial equivariance in the learning formulation. It's actually very important, especially in this kind of low data regime that we don't have a lot of training data. Okay, so to summarize, I think uh, 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 one thing that really surprised us is actually in, in the process of developing Flingba is how simple the system is, right? So the algorithm actually does not uh, perform any class modeling or state estimation and it's and it able to work very well. So for example, we never, uh, the algorithm never tried to reconstruct the 3D mesh of the class or estimating its pose or key points, it only used pixels. And I think the simplicity of this method really highlights the advantage of using dynamic actions for uh, deformable object manipulation, which fundamentally allows us to make use of the accelerations in your action in order to control those out of context surfaces. And also in this uh, project, we kind of highlight two uh, very useful strategies of uh, enable effective robot learning in the physical setup, that is using subsurface learning to scale the data collection and the leveraging the, the problem structure like spatial equivariance to enable sample efficient learning. But obviously, uh, this formulation is not able to solve all the robotics tasks. And uh, one of the limitations that we, I really want to highlight here for a system like Flingbot is their limited action precision. Right? Because um, in, the, in the system, when we train it, all it cared about is actually the cost coverage. That's why we can so easily compute the reward function. And as a result, the system actually does not really care about what kind of configuration it's, uh, the, the cost is actually end up with. So as a result, 
all the examples or configuration I'm showing here is considered as equally good for the system. And uh, the system also does not have the control of like achieving one particular uh, configuration within this set. So that's probably okay for a task of a class unfolding, but not all the robotics manipulation has have this luxury, right? So for many manipulation has precision or it's, it's very critical and important. And here is just an example. Right. So, <laughs> so imagine if you want to do a task like this, I, I think you probably will agree with me that the precision is very, very critical. Um, and and, uh, and for, to make a system like Flingwell to achieve this task is probably not sufficient. Right. So what is the d difference? I think fundamentally, for a task like this, it really just have a much narrower set of goal conditions or, uh, because of the high precision requirement. Right. So as a result, um, it's really hard or almost impossible for a system like Flingwell that just can learn directly from trial and error without any prior knowledge about the dynamical system. So in the next part of my talk, I will try to focus on this category of tasks that has uh, much higher precision requirements. Uh, and we'll also use this example to see how a, a dynamics model learned from an inaccurate simulator can help us in achieving this task or like learning, acquiring this kind of skills. So in this project, we kind of look into two type of uh, application like the skills. One is kind of uh, it's whipping a rope to uh, to hit a particular goal. That kind of like simplifies the Jenga task that we are uh, thinking about. And then the other is kind of swing a class uh, to a target configuration. You can imagine that's a more precise version of Flink mod. And in both tasks, we kind of define the goal by the target key point uh, configuration, like the key point locations. And then because the the key point, the target goal configuration is still outside the robot reach range. Therefore, it still requires the robot to use dynamic actions. So in fact, if you think about it, uh, this task is actually really hard, uh, even for us. right? So we actually did this experiment in our lab. If you uh, give you an unknown rope that you have never practiced before, it's actually very unlikely that you can hit the goal with the first, within the first trial. But the good thing is that typically we we'll observe that after two or three attempts, uh, the, uh, the person is able to kind of get in closer and closer to the goal and eventually hit the target. So, what do we, how we, uh, I think it's worth to think about how we as humans are able to perform this task, right? So, did we actually learn to predict the full trajectory, the, the, the full forward dynamics uh, from our action within these two or three attempts? I think very unlikely. At least I don't think I can because it's quite a complex trajectory. And then, uh, did we try to learn to decode, uh, explicitly decode the rope parameters like its stiffness or its non-uniform density, I think also very challenging, it's, it's very hard. So I think what is that, what we really rely on, is a very simple intuition about how to adjust our action in order to affect our trajectory. Right? So for example, we know that if we swing harder, the rope will go higher. Right? Although we don't know by exactly how much, but we know the general direction. And then we can basically rely on this kind of intuition in order to iteratively adjust our action and getting closer and closer to the goal. So our hypothesis or observation here is that this knowledge about this adjustment, where you can think about this as a gradient uh, of the action and the effect, is actually much easier to learn and also more generalizable, transferable to different objects. So uh, in this project, uh, we uh, kind of distill this kind of observation or hypothesis into an algorithm uh, called iterative residual policy. So at its core, uh, how it works is that we'll learn a delta dynamics model that will try to, uh, the, the input to this delta dynamics model is an observed result of trajectory uh, tracked by a calibrated camera. And then it will take in another delta action uh, as, as an input, and it will try to output an uh, inferred trajectory uh, if we try to apply this delta action on top of the current action. And so, and here the robot action uh, is parameterized uh, with their target joint angle and the maximum joint speed. And then the whole trajectory is basically a linear motion in joint speed, uh, and uh, uh, in the joint space. And the robot always starts with the same uh, initial configuration. And then as you can see that under this formulation, the system does not need to learn the whole mapping, or like the, the complicated trajectory mapping directly from the action. So instead, all, all we need to learn is to predict um, how to deform the observed trajectory conditions on the delta action, which is much easier to learn compared to like the, the direct forward uh, uh, dynamics. And then once we are able to learn this delta dynamics model, the rest of part is actually quite uh, straightforward. We can just iteratively 
sample a bunch of different delta actions, and we can uh, select the, the better delta action for the next iteration to improve uh, the whole uh, uh, the overall uh, result. And the one challenge here is actually we're gonna uh, we are only able to learn this delta dynamics model in a very inaccurate simulator because we actually need a lot of training data to learn this delta dynamics model, and we can only afford it to collect the training data in simulator. But the simulator is actually not be able to like, reflect all the complexities in the real world or all the possible real world physics. So uh, that is actually one of the challenge of learning this delta dynamics model and make sure that it transfer into the real world. So here is just an example to highlight the same to real uh, gap. Right? So on, uh, in both examples, we actually use the same rope that was measured parameter and the robot actually executing the same action. And you can see that there's a huge sim to real gap. And uh, I think this is another uh, example to show that if we just learn the forward dynamics model, there's no way that this model is able to generalize and still be useful in the real world. But our hope is that learn the delta dynamics, at least this general direction, uh, is transferable. All right, so to validate that, we actually test with a large variety. Oh, question? And is this model a neural network? Or what oh, it's a neural network. Yeah, so it's an image in uh, and an action in and an image out. So it's a CNN, yeah. Okay, so we, we try to validate whether it can generalize or transfer to real world uh, uh, ropes, and we actually test with a large variety of ropes that with very different uh, dynamic uh, properties. Right? So for example, in the second uh, example, it is not really a rope, a rope, it's just a long piece of cloth that has very high uh, air resistance, as you can imagine when it's wind. And then the third example is a bow whip that is much stiffer, and it also has non-uniform linear density. And the both properties actually just our cannot be captured in our simulator. It cannot, it's not captured in our training data. And it really requires the system to adapt with the real world of visual observation. So here I'm just gonna quickly show you, first uh, show you some of the quantitative results of uh, the system in action. Uh, so here is actually the convert, uh, the uh, rope trajectory after uh, the, the system is converged on the same goal. Right, the first thing that you can uh, notice is that the robot will really use very different action uh, to achieve the same Go uh, location, but in order to accommodate different rope dynamics. And then in our paper, we also try to kind of uh, perform a more systematic study about the, the model's generalization capability with different um, uh, uh, type of test scenarios with increasing level of difficulties. Right? So in all these ex experiments, our, our all methods will be using the same model training simulator. So for example, in the simulation environment, we can Uh, so in the simulation environment, we can actually explicitly test how well the, the learned delta dynamics model is able to generalize to new row parameters that is interpolating between the, uh, the training row parameters or extrapolating beyond the row parameters. So if you are familiar with machine learning, you'll probably know that extrapolation is actually significantly harder than uh, in, uh, uh, interpolation, and it's also actually reflected in the results. Typically, uh, extrapolation will have higher errors. And then we also test with different real world ropes that you just shot us a see with very different uh, 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 dynamics property. And then in the end, we also test with um, uh, the same model on the different robot hardware by changing the length of robot's last link. Right? So this actually basically changed all the mapping between robot's action and its effects, and it really forced the system to adapt online. And here is just a, a few quick conclusions or uh, things we observed. So first is that when we compare to uh, methods like new system identification, we can see that directly learning the optimal policy based on the row parameter is actually quite difficult. And uh, even with even if we use the ground truth row parameters, right? And it also has trouble generalizing to new row parameters, especially in the extrapolation case. And, uh, and, and also, when we compare to other like iterative control methods, we realize that it's actually not very easy to approximate the dynamics model in these particular scenarios. Uh, but we tried both linear approximation and a heuristic error function, and they are not uh, able to sufficiently capture the, the complex dynamics. And then in the real world experiments, we actually test with quite strong baselines that uh, we call it optimal action optimizing simulation with the measured row parameters. Right. So in that scenario, you can imagine if the model in simulation is matching the real world, it should always give us the perfect uh, result. But in reality, it still oftentimes achieve more than 10 centimeter error, again, highlights the big sim to real gap. So uh, I'm going to show you one last experiment with this uh, 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 project is we try to stress test the system with some unexpected online interactions. 
So what we do is that in the middle of the experiment, when the system kind of already converts uh, on, the, on the go, we try to tie a few knots on the rope. So that action actually basically changed uh, two critical parameters, like the length of the rope and also the linear densities. And so immediately after this interruption, we can see that there's a much higher error um, because of the change of the dynamics. But very quickly, the system is able to adapt this action uh, according to uh, its visual feedback and we get a good performance. So this kind of rope tying accident actually happened a few times during our experiments, and we were actually ourselves pretty surprised that it still works. That's why we include this experiment in our paper. And then just um, one last thing, in order to kind of uh, show or validate the generality of, of this ARP framework, we also try to apply the same method to a very different task with minimal modifications, which is this cost placement task. Uh, we basically change it from 1D deformables to 2D deformables. So long story short, uh, the method will still work, uh, the only change that we need to make is that uh, we need to change the input trajectory uh, from one trajectory uh, into uh, two different trajectories corresponding to nine, uh, no, not two, nine different trajectories uh, corresponding to nine different key points on the clock. And uh, for this task, the system typically converge within three steps. So uh, to summarize, I think uh, you can really see IRP or like uh, iterative residual policy as a very general learning framework that is applicable to repeatable tasks uh, with complex dynamics. Uh, so I think one important lesson we learned uh, in this project is that instead of trying to directly learn the full forward dynamics model, we can actually instead learn this delta dynamics model that will match how the changes in the action will result in the changes of trajectory. And in your experiment, it shows that it's more generalizable to uh, a lot of new different uh, scenarios that outside its training data. So uh, I think if we take a step back, we can also see this ARP framework as an interesting way of trying to distill relevant knowledge from a highly inaccurate simulator. Right? So we have a, a, a simulator that's able to kind of simulate this process, but it's very inaccurate. Uh, and I think this kind of perspective is applicable for a wide range of systems that uh, often has involved very complex dynamics that is very hard to model or simulate. And uh, that's that spec can also potentially open doors for many unconventional, uh, unconventional robot hardwares that oftentimes people may think is impossible to model or simulate, and therefore people try to avoid. And a good example for this kind of unconventional and hard to model hardware is error based manipulation. Uh, right? In this, uh, oh, oops. Let's go back. I think the video maybe has, it's a little bit too quick. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so error-based manipulation. In this project, Dexterity, uh, we actually uh, make the robot learn how to uh, use active airflow in order to manipulate, uh, in, uh, control active airflow to manipulate different deformable objects like unfolding a cloth or opening a bag. And as you can imagine, in this, a system like this, both the aerodynamics and the deformable objects are extremely hard to simulate. Right? So, but what we found is that it's actually possible to learn, uh, it's actually much easier to learn how to adjust the blower direction based on the visual feedback and uh, uh, train a closer policy in order to do this task. Uh, so for example, in this class unfolding task, although the underlying dynamics is very hard to model, the, uh, the adjustment action is much easier to learn. You basically just blow to the direction that the class is not, folded, uh, not unfolded. Uh, so as a result, we can, by using learning or directly learning the policy, we can bypass the problem of modeling this complex underlying dynamics. And by the end of learning, actually, the system is able to unfold a large variety of class uh, that uh, actually is not be able to unfold with the earlier fling bar system due to the speed limit. Right? So due to the speed limit, uh, this long class, uh, long dress, is actually too large to uh, actually be fully unfolded by the fling bars. But we can easily unfold it with, by using um, active error. And we actually don't even need any high-speed robot movement in this scenario. Just a $20 error point that you can buy from Amazon. And of course, uh, there's many other applications that you can think about by using air uh, in your system. Right? So for example, opening a default bag or blowing leaf into a target location. And it's actually interesting to think about both of those applications. It's actually very challenging if you only think about contact-based manipulation. Right? Just think about how you can pick up the, those leaf one by one using hands. But by using this kind of airflow or like by, by leveraging the airflow, we can now um, have the opportunity for the system to kind of simultaneously apply a dense force in a large 3D space without directly contacting the object and therefore making those tasks a lot easier. 
Yeah, so uh, takeaways, I think, for both of these projects, what we see is that learning a dynamics model, uh, even highly inaccurate ones, can be very useful for planning. And in both examples, we also kind of see that the model learned in today's simulator are oftentimes limited in their accuracy. Um, and in both of the projects, we actually try to use visual feedback to bridge this gap of inaccuracy. And however, another way to think about this problem is that if we already have a robot or active agents that kind of interacting in the physical world and observing its, its action, then can we just basically ask this, the robot to directly learn a world model or this dynamics model from its, uh, all its real world interactions and observations? Right? So that's actually lead to the last topic of today's talk, which is skill from skills to world model. So in this part of the talk, I'm going to kind of uh, focus on slightly different uh, aspect or the role of manipulation. Right? So instead of thinking about manipulation as the way to rearranging object or rearranging the world, I think manipulation is also a very important way for us to learn about the visual world. Right? So for example, if you think about your day-to-day -day life, oftentimes you, you manipulate an object not just only to change its position or orientation, but also maybe just trying to uh, gather some useful information about objects or environment. Right? So for example, you can open your drawer in order to judge to see what's inside. So if we reflect this, uh, this idea into a, a robot system, we can call it as an interactive perception system, uh, where in, under this framework, uh, manipulation is no longer just a downstream application for perception, but also can play a, very, a, a supportive role for the perception algorithm to better model the world. Right, so for example, we can make the robot to kind of interact or play with different objects in order to estimate their physical properties, or kind of uh, cut through uh, objects in order to estimate its internal structure, like where, locate where the core is in an avocado, or similarly uh, interacting with the deformable object in order to estimate its kinematic structure, where is the joints, where, what are the joint parameters. And in all these examples, we can see that the robot is actually able to get those information that's extremely hard to obtain from passive observation alone. Right? Physical parameter, you cannot just infer it from uh, the visual appearance. And today I'm going to talk a little bit more about the first project, which is called Dance FizzNet. Right? So in this project, the goal we are trying to achieve is to make the system learn about objects' physical properties by, using, by training a visual predictive model. So this model, again, is a, a, a learning model that's basically trying to predict what will, will happen or what will be the uh, object's motion if you apply certain action. And then our hypothesis here is that by learning to predict object future state uh, under different action, the model should be able to acquire implicit understanding about object physical property. But one interesting thing that we found in our experiments is that this hypothesis is actually not always true, and it's actually highly dependent on the type of action the robot executes. Right, so for example, if the robot only uses quasi-static interactions, uh, like pushing all the, this object very slowly, then they don't even have a chance to actually learn about uh, the object's physical properties through this observation. The object will always stop in the same location, uh, regardless of the, their difference in, in terms of their mass and friction. So at most, your model is able to learn about action, but not about objects. And similarly, uh, we found that also the diversity of the action is also very important because object's motion is oftentimes jointly influenced by multiple physical properties, and therefore it really needs a different interaction to, uh, in order to decouple them. So uh, to address those uh, issues, we actually designed two types of interactions uh, that is sliding and the collision in order to reveal the object's physical property. And then the, predictive, the visual predictive model is again trained with a self-supervision that is corrected by the camera that uh, like basically uh, the, we are training it with the supervision of uh, object motion that is directly observed by the camera. And here is a system in action that the robot is playing with three different uh, blocks with very different physical properties. And on the right, we visualize the fissure embeddings for all the pixels, each dot corresponding to one pixel, and the color indicates object instances. In the beginning, you can see that the feature embedding is actually quite uh, clustered together that you, don't, you cannot really distinguish between different objects in the feature embedding. However, while the system is able to kind of uh, interact with uh, all these different objects, you can see that the feature uh, starts to be more and more gradually separated on the embedding space, which indicates that uh, this feature starts to encode or uh, learn about object physical property. And in the end, we can actually just learn a, a very, uh, uh, like train a very simple linear decoder to decode explicit uh, physical parameters of all these objects, like this mass and friction. And here is a, uh, the plot of uh, the predicting, uh, 
decoding error with respect to interaction set because that typically is able to uh, uh, kind of get more and more accurate in, uh, estimation with more interaction. And then when we compare with a system that only uses quasi-static action, like slow pushing, we can see that uh, the dynamics action is actually quite important to really reveal the physical properties of the object. And then the best performance is always achieved by uh, using both of the sliding and the collision action, uh, which demonstrates that the diversity of action is also important. So I think uh, this set system project is really trying to show that uh, I think that the major difference for the for, for this project compared to the earlier project is that we're really trying to learn a general model uh, that's try to model the physical world that is not tailored to a particular uh, task or robot action. Right? So in our paper, we actually also show that this learned object physical representation, uh, when it combined with the physics engine, it actually can be used for planning for uh, new robot actions or tasks that the system is now trained on before. And uh, our uh, experiment shows the importance of action, which really directly determines the quality uh, of the learned uh, physical representation. So that's how we can learn a physical model through robot manipulation skills. And if we combine with the, the earlier part of my talk, which kind of shows us how learning different dynamics models, uh, even inaccurate ones, could help the robot to acquire new manipulation skills. And if we put them together, we can kind of see this as a general formulation of our approach of how to get uh, to learn this kind of general robot intuition. And then I think uh, in terms of how we can move forward, I think it's really interesting and important to think about how we can potentially accelerate this positive feedback loop in order to potentially uh, achieve this flywheel effect towards human level dynamics reasoning. And uh, that's definitely a very challenging task, and, but I think there's a two critical steps that we always need to uh, kind of uh, address or hit on. Right, so uh, I'm just going to quickly talk about them. So first is uh, we really need a more general form of skill representation. Right, so in most of the top, uh, projects I present today, they actually all kind of uh, rely on or make use of those manually design action primitives like tossing or flinging. And uh, that's very useful for learning because we can kind of map those very complex action sequence into a few low-dimensional uh, low learnable parameters and make the learning uh, feasible. However, uh, those primitives actually are not very, uh, it's not general enough to potentially represent all possible robot actions, especially the ones that require high-rate reactive behaviors. So for a while, uh, our group really has been thinking uh, very hard about how we can get a more general policy representation that can potentially encompass a broader range of robot behaviors. And the, one of the recent directions that we are, are working on and thinking about is to use uh, diffusion models as a general, uh, as a universal skill representation. Right, so here is actually just a quick uh, preview of all the different manipulation skills that can be learned with the diffusion policy. So all different uh, applications are actually trained um, with the same uh, network architecture. And uh, it's actually able to directly learn them from uh, uh, the uh, visual observation like pixels. And uh, to get all these different uh, action, uh, like this kind of behaviors, we don't need to code up any of the action primitives. We just need to provide the data. And the robot is able to learn uh, this kind of reactive behaviors. And so for example, in this case, the robot is actually able to learn so how to organically switching between pick and place and push action. And it's also able to pretty robustly recover from failures. And those kind of behavior is actually quite hard to code up with just motion primitives. And uh, just a quick word about what's diffusion model. Like, I, think, um, I think you probably heard about diffusion model for image generation, like DALI. Right? So I think fundamentally, what diffusion model give us is a very powerful way to kind of model this, uh, to model any complex distribution or multi-model distribution in high dimensional continuous action space, which turn out to be very important for modeling robots' behaviors. And uh, here is, just a quick comparison of uh, like the, the multimodal uh, behavior that's able to be captured by diffusion policy and also other uh, alternative methods. So we are actually really excited about this result. And together with TRI, who has a lot of robots and resources, we really try to scale up this system to potentially hundreds of different tasks. Um, and uh, we also, I think this is probably most important, we open source our code and we also have a very detailed tutorial for you guys to download and try it out for your problem. And if you have questions or issues, let us know. Um, so that's about the general form of skills. And I think it's also, apart from that, we also need a more general form of dynamics model representation. Right? So, so far, all the projects that we talked about, we're kind of trying to learn this dynamics model directly through physical interactions. 
either in real world or the simulator, which is probably the most direct way to learn about physical intuition. But uh, I think at the same time, we can also think about how we can potentially augment those dynamics models with some kind of common sense knowledge that's already stored in the internet data and use it as a part for exploration. Right, so for example, uh, if you ask your like chat GPT or GPT-304, it can easily tell you that if you throw an egg, it will break. Right? So as a result, for those kind of dangerous or irreversible dynamics, we really don't need a robot to learn them through trend error. And you probably already know there's a lot of work that's using large X model on robotics, and there's already a lot of successful stories. But I think the core challenge is always has been how we can ground those large X models uh, precisely into the physical world through perception and low-level robot actions. Right? So that is something that we are actively thinking about and working on, and I think it will probably continue into the future for a while. Okay, so with that, I want to conclude today's talk with just a few closing notes. Right? So today I talked a lot about manipulation, which is arguably one of the most challenging and uh, uh, hard problems in manipulation. And for a while, I think we have been seeing this manipulation task as just real, uh, as a task of trying to rearrange objects through proper context. Right? And uh, but I really hope that this talk can give you some new perspective about this classical problem, especially if you try to start to treat dynamics as part of the solution, not the problem. Right, so for example, we can start to think about manipulation beyond context, like, for, uh, like using action operations or error in order to control those out of context surfaces. And similarly, we can also expand the scope or the goal of manipulation instead of just use it as a way to rearrange objects. It can also be a very important way for us to know about the environment or gather information about the object of the world. And finally, we can also rethink about the way that we model dynamics model. So where a perfectly accurate model may not always be necessary, uh, and instead, we can think about how we can learn in accurate models and combine it with visual feedback to achieve more adaptable and precise manipulation. And most importantly, I hope that all these examples can help you to rethink about how we should design the robotic system in general. Instead of uh, always trying to avoid dynamics, we could fully embrace it. And uh, that's the end of my talk. And I want to thank all my collaborators, funding agencies, and most importantly, my students. And here is actually a drawing by my students that draw about their uh, research. So for example, oh. here is a green bar. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, uh, like, here is a rope project that's hitting a target. And that's the Arabic uh, project. So you actually spend some time, you can find all the projects I talked about today <laughs> there. Uh, and I'm really lucky to work with all these uh, fantastic students in my lab. And uh, thank you for listening, and happy to take questions. Okay, questions. I have a question. For one of, um, I think, like the middle project, um, you mentioned that it only requires three steps to learn. So is that like three task executions after simulation training, or what were the three? Yeah, so the three steps uh, uh, is. So in the rope example, it just three swing. Uh, I see. And how do you think? And it actually, oh, let me just, just add one more thing to clarify. Uh, the model actually do, do not update with those observations. It just adjusts its delta action based on those uh, observations. So the delta dynamics model, the model that we learned, it never gets updated. Uh, but it just observes the, um, the trajectory and then resample the delta action. And how is that model learned? Yes. How, how how does that model learn? That is learned with the simulation data. Yeah. Wait, sorry. So because like wouldn't the input to the model be just like the pixel values of the camera, right? Mm -hmm. So if you run it once and it has a certain error, what's the input to the model like the second time you run it if you're not modifying the model? The model is not modifying, the input is modified. The the sample action will be different each time. But wouldn't this, the like input be the pixel values of the camera? So those. So we sample a lot of different actions, and then you you output also a lot of different. So you you have a lot of candidates of uh, actions, uh, that is centered around your current action, and then your uh, the, the data dynamics model basically predicts what will be the real projection looks like, and you compare it with the goal, uh, and then you pick the one that's uh, getting closer to the goal, and then you execute that action. That will change the observation again. 
and then uh, you assemble the action and do a basically. The actual dynamics model does not get updated. Um, I have a question for the uh, green box or mm. in general the deformable object manipulation mm -hmm. process. Because it's mapped from the pixel information, right? Mm. Has the loss of depth information ever caused any trouble for the final policy? Yeah, so um, let, let me try to understand your question. We. Um, the system uses RGBD camera, oh, but 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 uh, actually, in order to compute the reward, we actually only use a color camera to compute the reward. Uh, I guess your question is whether the depth matters. Yeah. Um, the depth should matter, but we choose not to use it because the depth sensor is too noisy. Yeah. yeah. So the depth should matter because it actually tells you how crumpled the cloth is. Mm -hmm. But uh, we use a real sense camera, and it, I think for that part, I would use a real sense camera, and it's just too noisy to actually get useful information. And yeah, it also has a big seam to real gap. Yeah. Uh, that's my experience for the real, um, for, uh, real sense camera. Yeah, you can actually, one thing we found later, yeah, in later project, you can switch it to um, uh, the, the latest Kinect uh, from, from Microsoft. Uh, okay. I think they no longer call it Kinect, but uh, I think that one is much better. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, and also, just, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, is there any way? The policy of what the your learning framework can be adapted with the camera attached to the edit vector. Mm. Um. I, uh. I think it's possible. Actually, for the diffusion policy project, uh, they use a wrist mount camera, uh, instead of uh, a static camera, and it's quite important for those very precise manipulation tasks. Uh, so that you can actually get a close-up view. But it also makes the learning harder because you can imagine the, you know, if you don't have a static camera, then you have a large uh, variations in terms of observation. Yeah. Yeah. You need more data. That, that's what I mean. Yeah. I see. Uh, hi, I have a question. Can we go back to the uh, slide page where you mentioned the visual exclusive area? Yes. This one? Yes, this one. And mm -hmm. I think it's a few slides after that. So you mentioned that uh, instead of uh, like designing a direct policy output that uh, just generates the action, we should uh, like generate a dense value map for all actions. Yeah. So what's the intuition for that design? Yeah, so um, there are actually a few different intuitions come from different aspects, right? So if, if we look at the, the equivariance uh, aspect, so by predicting a dense value map, we're basically uh, just directly predicting values for all the possible actions if you only consider the uh, 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 translation. So in that case, if you use convolutional neural network, the convolution kernel already gives you this kind of translational equivariance. So that's uh, the reason, one of the reasons why this is a better formulation. Yeah, and the second question after that, so for a very large action state where we have high dimensional outputs, uh, would this method be limited because we cannot efficiently generate values for all of them? That's a very good question. So uh, you can see that for this method, it's, it works well with 2D action. Uh, if you have rotation, we can also do augmentation. Scale can do augmentation. One thing that we found, uh, like uh, at some point, we found it challenging to generalize to like six stop grasping, for example. But uh, there are recent methods that, uh, like this is actually on this slide, um, there are uh, recent equivariant neural networks that allows us to generalize to three uh, I see three equivariant states. Uh, and I think that's actually uh, very useful. But if you think about even higher dimension, like the joint space, then the question is that uh, in that action space, it's actually no longer equivariant. Oh. Yeah, so the equivariant is actually on the n factor action space. Uh, so there is some certain limitation about this uh, structure. Yeah. I have a follow-up question. Mm. Uh, the map on this previous slide, I still don't understand really how you get that the back Like, how do you generate that map? Yeah, so uh, this is a convolutional neural network that predicts the value for every pixel. And then the robot will execute, let's say that the robot will execute this action. This is, you pick the maximum value to execute. Uh, the maximum value means that the best, uh, the action will increase the, 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 the size, the, the biggest. You execute this action, and then you, 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 get, the, you get the observation on the delta uh, cross coverage, and you only back up to that one pixel. So, what if you have like a not fully reachable space? Like it's trying to predict something that it can't actually access. Oh, we, we always filter out the, 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 uh, the value map with the accessibility for the, the kinematic range for the robot. We don't consider the range that's outside the range. Yeah. What if, I'm just trying to picture if it's, 
when you talk about ideas, but I mean, you, this one also, I think you said I wanted to see this. Oh, actually, it's a few days. Uh, a few days of the data collection. So uh, but you would need a lot of time to try everything before we're Kind of, it. yeah. So it's, it's a trial and error process. It's a few days of data collection. But it's still uh, possible to train even with a few days uh, because of leveraging the structure. Otherwise, if you uh, it probably need a million of states, so like, yeah. And you think for different fabrics or lots of different fabrics? So a few days for a few different uh, fabrics. We actually train with different ones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so I can generalize a little uh, to, to across different fabrics and different colors. Yeah. Okay, I think we're at time and we have lunch coming up, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs>